All right, Matt. So it's a pretty exciting day for us. We've uh, we've cut a long way with this kind of cloud stuff. Uh, we've been kind of tweaking and, and revising this and, and refining it for years and years and years now. And we think it's ready to go to, to a product launch. Uh, we're pretty excited about that. But I wanted to kind of take a look back at where we started with this and how, you know, the, this cloud stuff all came to be for us, how we got into kind of developing our own system. Do you remember, I, I mean, I'm sure you do, but our, our first start and what, what that was like. Oh, painfully, painfully well, I remember. You know, we got started, we didn't have enough to buy two licenses. So we bought one full license and we had to share the hasp by physically driving it back and forth to each other's houses. So one of us works the day shift and then there's a 40 minute commute between the two of us so that the other one can work a night shift and then have to bring it back so the next person can start during the day again. And being able to roll that all into one remote station was absolutely groundbreaking for us. Yeah. Cause I mean, we started with, you know, what, $3,000 in the bank to, to kind of cover us. We, we were really anxious to just say, all right, Hey, it's time to go. Let's get this done and, and just get started. Right. We were, you know, we had a couple of customers that we'd been moonlighting for, but to take it to that next level, we really had to kind of maximize every penny of productivity that we could out of that license. And for us, that meant driving back and forth every day to, to share that thing when we were, you know, at peak productivity. It was, and it was brutal. And how long did we do that? Oh, we did that for the first year, almost. It took us about a year before we were able to come up with our first solution, which was simply a software that allowed us to forward the has back and forth to each other which at least eliminated the drive. Yeah. So at that point, you were able to hold on to the hasp and then you could disable it off your machine and forward it over the internet to my machine and I could use the license and I could work. So at least we didn't have that perilous drive, which by the way, that first winter, I remember driving by stands of trees at two o'clock in the morning, just laying on my horn, both to keep the deer away from me and also to keep myself awake while I was driving. Because oh, I yeah. had been working, you know, all day, and it, I I don't do well after ten o'clock. I'm tired. I can't. I, yeah, fortunately for issue. us, it worked out that I'm a night owl, and you're, you know, right. more more of the morning person. So we were able to to switch those and and keep that productive. But yeah, that that USB over IP software was a big big change for us. It really kind of made things a lot a lot better. Uh, but then we went to, you know, we added a third person and another license and things got much more complicated. Right. And what we tried, I think we tried the same thing. You know, we followed the natural progression that every detailer at the time tried. They tried a VPN, right? And you would share this data, you know, a, a hard drive across the internet and try to all kind of be on the same thing. And that just worked terribly. It was, Oh, it was, that was a disaster. Yeah. yeah. And we put real money into that too. We built a server and we put it, unfortunately at my home office, which I live in the sticks. My internet is not so good. So everyone trying to tunnel into my machine couldn't get the proper speeds because my internet's just terrible. And SDS is really touchy about that license at times. Yeah. And it, it, it didn't, it didn't work well. Uh, so what we were doing for the longest time, you know, we used Dropbox to sync our files, but it was, okay, you're working on job a, uh, he's working on job B I'm working on job C. Everybody's oh, doing their own thing. That. And then we would have to, you know, all right, send me the, the model file. Oh, poop. You were working in a spot that I didn't notice and I didn't bring in a new model file. And now we lost the day of work. Uh, and that stuff happened constantly. Like, I mean, constantly right. is an exaggeration, but it happened too much, right? And it was it was a day killer and frustrating. And it always seemed to happen when you were most pressed for time because when you're oh, stressed, absolutely. that's when it, you forget about things. Under the gun, and I had no idea that you had taken a model the entire weekend and worked on it and hadn't uploaded it. And so I just picked up where I left off on Friday, on Monday, get right back into it and go, go, go. And it's not till Wednesday that I realize, you know, we're talking about something and you say, Hey, I already did that. What are you doing? And we look and, and that's, you know, we both, Oh no, we, 
we're outdated here. So do we throw away your two days over the weekend or my two days of Monday, Tuesday that yep. ignored your two days? And, and the key was always, was always to rip depressing. the bandaid off and just decide whose work was going to go kaput. Right. Cause there was, there was no saving it. There was just nope. nothing like that. Um, and so, you know, we, we went that way for a while. That was at least a year that we did that. Uh, and we tried, we tried very briefly the step that a lot of people are at right now, uh, which is they have a machine built, right? They have all the machines sitting in one office and you just RDP into the office. Right. And, you know, everybody gets, gets there and it's okay. Right. Uh, the problem is, is that that many people tunneling into an office, that office has to have a really robust connection. Um, to, to really kind of support that. And it's, it's the weak spot and it costs a lot of money, like up, you know, up front to build all of those machines and then maintain them. Oh, absolutely. And, and if the internet in the office goes down, <clears throat> you're, you're done. <laughs> yeah. Right? I, I remember speaking with a few people at a user group conference a couple of years back and finding out that they dropped $10,000 to build that server in their, in their office. And a few years later, they're going to have to re replace it. You have to start swapping out parts. Things burn out. Things get outdated by the technology. And you, you wind up having to pay $10,000. And then a few years later, you're $10,000 in the hole again. And again and again and again, this is going to be a, a, a revisited cost you have to deal with. That's a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. Building servers is expensive and maintaining them over the, the long term is just as expensive, right? Like we just, absolutely we couldn't justify it. We couldn't figure out how do we get this money? Like the startup costs were so prohibitive. I just, no, I, 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 I refuse to do it, right? Like it's, and, and we're big into investing in our company too. We don't have that hesitation generally to buy the good software that we need, good computers, all of that stuff. But this was just too much. It, it, it seemed like throwing good money after bad. Yeah. And that brings us to kind of the, the current system that we've got, although from there, you know, we have since refined and refined and refined, which, you know, I, I said, I know that Amazon has this cloud, this AWS system, right? That you can buy computers and servers and run them in, in, the, in the cloud. Right. Let's go try it, right? Let's go, we'll go buy one of these machines or rent one and, and get started on it. We'll use the, the USB over IP to get the hasp up there uh, and just go, right? Give it a shot. And it was a entirely different ball game. It was considerably faster. It was, the, the I mean, the networking between these machines is 10 gigabit, right? It is right. wicked, wicked fast. Um, and so now instead of having five people all tunnel into a one gig connection, right? It, one, it, not one gig. That's, that's, that wasn't even close. A 30 megabit connection, right? <laughs> all, all kind of killing that. We're dialing into, uh, you know, a server, which is basically a supercomputer running at 10 gigabit ethernet, which was fantastic. And the processing speed, the, the, uh, the, the robustness of their connections, the amount right, of memory that right. we could get. The read write speed on their on their systems are phenomenal as well. Yeah, and that's hard, a that's a huge factor in how SDS runs. Right, that that hard drive speed over the NVMe storage or even just their SSD, which is generally what we recommend. NVMe is available, right, and we've used it on occasion, but it's it's too much. It's 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 faster <laughs> than SDS two can even handle. Um, and we played with it a lot to to try and find out where our costs are what's you know what's the best machine what's the best way to network it and i think and that's why now we're kind of getting this ready to go public right is it's it's ready like we've tested it over five years with all sorts of scenarios and i we've got it really well dialed in it works exceedingly well and the the linchpin the thing that made it this much easier for you know everyday users was the uh network licensing or not network licensing, but um, Haspless. Haspless SDS2 because the the Hasp, while it works USB over IP, it 
it's less user friendly than the Haspless. Uh, so once we got the Haspless, you're able to eliminate that little extra latency that you would get by having to call home for every command that you're using. So it just improved the system all the more and simplified the whole process. So you eliminate that extra software that we had to have and everything just runs seamlessly now. Yeah, yeah. And that, you know, the for those who are still using a Hasp uh, and still want to use that, it still worked great. We used it for, for years and years and years. Works fantastic. It's just a little bit better now, right? So if you're in the 2020, 2021, uh, absolutely, we recommend that you use the Hasp list. It's the, and, and it seems like they've switched some stuff in the engine too. So it's not going and making those calls to the Hasp so frequently um, that introduces that little bit of latency, some of those hiccups here and there. Um, so that's that, that's been really, really nice. Uh, and we, we absolutely commend STS2 for making that change because it, it was a long time coming. Um, so one of the, we're talking, while we're talking about licensing, can you talk about how split licensing has kind of really maximized our, our potential, our earning potential and, and lowered our costs? Absolutely. So we first got started, like most people do, we bought a full station and our second license was another full station. But what we started to kind of realize over time is I've got a station that's actually two stations at once, but only one person can use it. Right. So you can only really be modeling or be drafting. You can't actually do both at the same time. You can flip very quickly, but you can't actually do both at the same time. So why are we doing it this way and paying for a doubled up software package when we could have a dedicated modeling license where the dedicated modeler and a dedicated drafting license where somebody's actually making all the plans and sections and member details, getting the drawings together. And so what we started to do is we bought the split license. We've got one of each. So now we have four people working simultaneously, but it's the same price as if we had bought three because the drafting and the modeling roughly combined to about a full station's price. Ish. Ish. It's within wiggle room, but you're getting a lot more efficiency out of it because now you've got two people working on it. So you've got somebody who does the modeling. They may do some model checking if they're using MDM, and then they just move on to the next job. And then you have your drafting person who comes in behind, takes care of plans and sections. If they notice anything, they may call the modeler back and say, hey, you didn't do this you know, and, and give them some grief about it. But they move on to finish that job up, get it out the door while the modeler has moved on to the next project. And by having that sort of assembly line efficiency, we're able to reduce our software costs because we're not buying as much license up front. We're reducing our ongoing licensing fees, our, our uh, support fees over time, mm -hmm. because each of those split stations comes with a smaller annual bill. So we're saving our money, we're working more efficiently, and we're getting the absolute most out of the software that we can in that manner. Yeah, and the, the savings from that pretty much pays for the, the servers over the years, right? It's yeah. The servers are cheap enough that there's enough money left over from that. And it's not like we are changing our business to suit the licensing, right? the assembly line method has come up organically, right? Right. Pe some people are great scrubbers and are good at, at cleaning up those plans and all of that stuff. And other people are great modeler. Those are two separate skill sets and they should be two distinct employees generally, right? Like smaller firms, you've only got two people, right? All right. Everybody kind of does a little bit of everything, but odds are you're not sure. both doing the same thing at the same time. Uh, so you can really kind of maximize that that value because SDS2, these this software is not cheap. It is very very expensive. Um, you know, it's worth it. Right? It's it's like the old joke that they used to make about divorces, right? Why are divorces so expensive? Because they're worth it. <laughs> um, but with with the addition of that Hasbless. You're able to get those licenses, have them all up available, and anybody can grab just as much power as they need. And that is a big part of our message, right, is get the power that you need and don't 
by more. And it, it takes it takes me a little bit into what I call the the water tower method. But it seems like you don't really understand what I mean when I say that. Yeah, I I had to look that up a little bit, but uh, yeah, why, why don't you go ahead and explain to me what it is you're talking about when you say the water tower method when it comes to the computing world, especially. Yes. So there's a little bit of a misperception out there about what water towers do, right? Like a lot of people are under the impression that water towers store water, that that's their primary function, right? That we you fill it up and then over a year, they it drains out and then you fill it up again. Really, the idea of a water tower is to maintain water pressure so that it's, con it's always filling at, say, a thousand gallons per minute, right? But it's draining at a varied rate over time. So when everybody gets up in the morning and takes a shower, there's a lot more demand on the system, okay? To build a okay. pump that is big enough and fast enough to deal with that peak demand would be ridiculous. You would need a pump that's big enough to do all the households in the town times that many gallons that they're using. You would okay, never so you're talking be able about to... building. You're talking about then having to build a system that is designed around operating at maximum capacity for the entire town all the time. Right. If each, yeah, if each house okay. had their own pump, that pump, the, the net of all of those pumps oops, would be way oversized, right? Because sure. most of the yeah. time there is zero water happening. And that's the same thing that happens with SDS too. When you're, when you're doing basic modeling, when you're jumping around, when you're fixing your connections or scrubbing drawings, SDS2 is using very little of your capacity. But right. when you do those big processes, when you suddenly turn everything solid, when you detail a thousand members, SDS2 has this really, really high peak demand, right? Sure. So what we did that's different, the, the other cloud services and in general, what they do, even when you're doing local machines, is you build a machine that is overpowered for 90% of the time, right? really 98% of the time. But yeah. in that 2% time, it can save you a couple, you know, 10 seconds, 15 seconds of a process. It processes that much faster. Yeah. Well, so, and just to cut you off here. So anytime I've ever built a local machine to run SDS, I build a high-end gaming machine. Right. Lots and lots and lots of memory, lots of CPU, great video card, great, um, you know, uh, hard drives. Everything has to be high-end because I need to be able to handle the most that SDS can throw at it. Yeah. And okay. the, the reason what we do is different is we put several users on one super machine. Okay. Okay. So that, yep, it's really, really, really fast, right? But you're taking that speed and splitting about uh, out across, say, five users. Okay. One user can never slow down this machine, right? <laughs> Whatever you're doing, it's whipping through it. Basically, as fast as STS2 can handle it, it's throwing that much power at it. Right. But you don't need that much power times five because all five of those users aren't going to be hitting the process button at the same time on the job. Right. right? So they're sitting there at, you know, 20%, at 10%, usually at like 3% of CPU usage, yeah. while this guy over here is using the other 97%. So you're spreading it out across those five users and averaging their their processing speed so that at any given time, everybody has the power that they need, but you're not paying for it times five, you're paying for it times one. And okay. then that, that downtime is being used by the other four people in that interim. And it really, it saves a chunk of change versus building five machines that are as fast as they could possibly be. And at that rate too, each of your users has, I mean, 64 gigs of really high speed RAM is <laughs> that's valuable. Yeah, yeah right? that's like, a lot. Yeah. You can you can do a lot in it. And the the process that that we're running are their server processes. They're faster than consumer grade that you could ever get. And they really, really cook. Um, and it's I mean if you if you watch any of our videos, everything that we do is done on the cloud. Right. And you the it's even faster locally than what you see in the video. Cause a lot of times the videos is me recording zoom, which is restreaming the stream. Right. Right. So in any of our videos, I'm the one connected to the remote. 
So I'm getting that data beamed to my screen, but then I'm then streaming it back out to Nick, who's then recording it for Zoom. Well, yeah. so actually it's going to Zoom and then to you because Zoom is its own separate software. Yeah, I demoed it for one user who is used to using, you know, other cloud services. And he's like, this is, it's lightning in a bottle. And that's, it, that's really, it, it's, we're spoiled. We've been using it for ourselves for a long time. <laughs> yeah. uh, and we kind of forget, but you, you sit on that, those other systems and they're, they do okay, right? They, they're fine, but they're, you know, a consumer grade machine versus a, a much higher powered machine on the best internet in the world. And that's one of the things that I'm really proud of, right? Is you do not get higher reliability or higher speed, you know, the newest machines, whatever else on than AWS. It is top of the line, right. everything. <laughs> Yeah, right. AWS is. I mean, governments go to the AWS to to develop their own systems, right? Yeah, yeah, and that's, they have. That's the all, maximum requirement for reliability. Yeah, and the cool thing is, too, we can do whatever you need today. So, you know, uh, the, generally the cloud services are built on. Okay, this is much how much machine you buy and you get it every month. This is your thing. You're, it's a subscription based, right? Right. It's say three hundred dollars a month for machine X, and if it turns out that you picked up a stadium job, or that you, you need help or whatever else, you have to subscribe to get more. F for us, it's on demand, right? You tell us, okay. I'm going to be working on this job. It's got a thousand curved handrails. And every time I hit the button, SDS2, you know, drags, bogs down. It's brutal. Can you throw some more power at it? Yeah, absolutely. Shut down in two minutes. I'll have it upgrade and turn it back on. And you can have the power that you need for the next week. And then I'll turn it back off. Even the idea of turning a machine off, right? Turning your server off when you're not using it is something that you just can't do with these other cloud systems. And when we were looking at the pricing, that's one of the things we just fundamentally didn't understand. Right. Because you're buying an always on system. So it's the equivalent of uh, essentially, you know, I, I've got electric on in the house. I turn the lights off. I turn off things when I don't need them. Now imagine if instead of charging me for what I use, I get charged by my electric company for my maximum capacity. If I kept absolutely everything on all the time around the clock, that's the bill I get, but it's one flat rate. So it's nice and easy. Nothing to worry about. Right. Yeah. Oh, lose my, lose my butt on that deal. I'd rather turn things off and save the money. Yeah. And that's, that's what we do, right? Like when our servers aren't in use, if we take a week off, like the close the company, up, we're not paying in that week to maintain our stuff. It's all off, right? It's, right. It, it, it doesn't cost. So it means that when you need your machine, you boot it up in the morning and everybody goes to work. Now there is a downside. And I will mention this. If your model is what we call follow the sun, right? So you've got guys, in the states and they detail from nine to five and then from six till two in the morning local time right you've got somebody on the other side of the world detailing then you don't save as much money you might still save money we believe you will right but it's not as much but for right, people you're closer to keeping the lights on all the time right because you are you're leaving the lights on 18 hours a day instead of just 10 hours a day but you're using it but you're using it. So that's so as long as you're billing for that time, you know, Hey, right. more power to you. Right. Right. And that's the thing too, that I can't explain or understand enough. This is not our big way, our get rich scheme, right? This came about because we did it and detailers kept coming to us and saying, how did you do that? We want to do it too. And I would try to walk them through the process Right, but they don't. They don't have the time or the patience or the the know how to get it all set up, sure. right? So they would get frustrated and give up, right? And then go to a paid service that was just okay. Just turn it on for us. So I said, okay, right. We'll do the same thing. Now I'm not saying we're not going to make any money, right? 
but this is really a service that we're offering to detailers because we're detailers. That's our, our goal, right? Yes, we're going to make some money off it. That's, you know, capitalism. Great. But overall, it's, it's just one of our motives. Our real motive here is to make detailers more money. We love detailers. It's our thing, right? And we think right now they're paying for way more than what they're getting, and it's it's not the fault of the the other companies, right? That's what they know how to provide. That's what they're built for. Is right. they they physically had to go and buy servers and build them. They've got an office someplace with a server farm, and it's it's there. They've got to pay for that. It's got to be it's on all the time. So they need to use it all the time. We're not doing that, right? We have very very minimal startup costs. The startup costs for us are paying programmers to make this easier for our customers, right? To make it so that they can just press a button and their machine turns on and press a button and their machine turns off, right? Which is not how we've done it all the time, right? We had to pay for that development, somebody to do it. But the servers themselves, that's Amazon's problem, right? When when an update comes out, when a patch comes out, all that stuff is being taken care of by Amazon. The the, the 99.9999, I think it's five nines or something like that, uptime, right? That that reliability, the backups, the the generators, the flood protection, the, you know, they don't have just one site. They've got server farms across the country that if something, you know, if a bomb blows up one of them, we just take the data and set it to the other one, turn the machines on the next day, right? We had a system, you know, we got when, when, one of our new employees started, <laughs> we got a, what do they call it? Ransomware? Ransomware. Yep. Right. So we had, we had started out a new employee and this was uh, uh, quite a while ago actually, but we had an issue getting his password to work initially. So you weren't handy. So I made his password and I, I'm still embarrassed about this, but I made it test one, two, three, four, five. And it took two days for his account to get hacked because I never made it get changed after that. So we got him logged in for the day. We're happy. He's working. And two days later, boom, ransomware. Oh no. So the, the new employee is, you know, fr- freaking out a little bit. He's like, well, what do I, you know, what are we going to do? How are we going to get this data back? And I was like, dude, it's, <laughs> it's not a problem. Like it, give me an hour and everything will be back restored the way it was. We have our backups. We have all of this stuff automated. So you know, this isn't some machine that's sitting in somebody's office. There's a server. I wipe it. I install the, the fresh image from the last backup and poof, you're, you're back up and running. All of your data is safe. And that was a, a pretty big deal, right? Like that could have cost us thousands of, of dollars in downtime. And Absolutely. instead it, it took almost nothing to get it back up and running. Um, you know, there was some stuff that we learned from that as far as what, data we need to back up. There were some settings or settings files that we forgot to include in our backup. Yeah. As I remember, we had backed up all of our data files. So all of our projects that was all saved, but the actual SDS file structure itself, which contains all of your preferences, all of your global standards, all of those things, we back that up much less regularly. And we had made changes because we had gone to a new version. So we had all new toolbar configurations that were lost. We'd spent time making um, uh, global standard details that we wanted to utilize more often. Those were lost. So the things that we were backing up were the specific project files. Right. We didn't lose any of that, but it was getting that that underlying structure put back. You know, We learned from that. Okay, we need to back this up as well. It needs to be part of it. Yeah. And now since we hired people who know Amazon better than I did, right? Like, cause I just did this pecking around and trying to figure stuff out. All of that is automated behind the scenes. Right. And it's, it, you know, we get images every six hours. Now the, if you try hard enough, right. And you let people do stupid stuff, you're going to lose data. That's, that's how it's just a matter of how much data and, and where, you know, what, what your time is. So that's, right. that's kind of a big deal. Like you need to be responsible for your own stuff. You should be backing up regardless of what we do for backup. 
never trust anybody else with your backups. Yep. Do more do backups own, too. Do your own backups too, right? Do that. It's worth it. Um, particularly your data files, like your, the, the system itself, you don't have to worry about that at all. Right. But your SDS two models, your drawings, all that st- back that stuff up, right? Do it. It's, it's worth it. You want a couple copies of everything. We have a copy on Google drive. We have a couple of copy on our servers that gets backed up automatically. And we've got another copy that goes to Dropbox. All of that stuff, because we just, yep. we, we need to know that it's going to be there and it's going to be safe. Yeah. If um, our data is lost out of all three, it's already the end of the world. I don't care anymore. But if any one of those three goes down, we're still fine. It's still just an hour of a headache to put ourselves back in order. Right. And one of the things, the, the reason that it's important is that the, a lot of the ransomware will go in and find your backup files and corrupt those. Right. So you've got to, by using those Dropbox and Google Drive, they've got versioning. So you can find, okay, here's the last time that this, before that worm got in there, that right. this software. You can go to the good. version history and, and find your clean copy. Yep. So, um, Let's see. So I'm trying to think of some of the other things that people have talked to us about that, that frustrated them. Um, and I think one of the big ones is the every level of user, right, needs an account. So if you've, if you've got an office with 20 people and you've got somebody who almost never uses SDS2, but they need to get in there sometimes, they still need an account on other cloud services, right? We don't do it that way, right? The accounts are free right? The only thing you pay for for the account is your Windows license. And then after that, you can use it or not use it at your heart's content. If we build a machine that's intended for two users and you put six on it, that's your business, right? It's going to get slower the more users you put on it, but we don't care, right? So if you've got that person in your office who's a checker or maybe a document control person who just needs to go in and print drawings and then gets back out. You don't need a $300 a month account for that. You don't need a $50 a month account for that. You can have that, it's not a problem. If you've got a consulting engineer who wants to look at your models, same story, right? There's a one-time setup fee that is, it's because we have to pay for it, right? That right. to get Windows installed, that extra Windows license. But once that's done, it's yours. It's, it, it, it's you can split it up the way that you want to. Um, so can you kind of give me a breakdown and, and explain how does the pricing structure work? Because it, at the end of the day, what does it cost is the question that's going to be on everybody's mind. Yeah. So the, it, it's not as simple, right? And this is kind of a downside a little bit to, to our way. Our way is not as, as simple as it's $300 a month per user. Okay. What we say is, here are the different speeds of machines, okay? You can have a really, really fast machine and you can divide that between two people or you can divide it between six people, right? Your cost is the same. doesn't matter to us. Other than those Windows licenses, split that machine up however you want. Here's what you've got to pull from. Now, if you find that you put six users on that machine and it got slow, you want some more RAM, you call us up and you say, I need more RAM. We say, okay, we'll upgrade the machine. And the cost for that additional RAM is what you pay, right? So right. okay, let's say a machine that we think should be split for two active users costs a dollar per hour. And that's the important part, right? It's per hour that it's on. At the end of the night, you turn it off, okay? If you're not working for the next two weeks, you turn it off, Okay so that you pay nothing in that time. Right. So if somebody's on vacation and you want to work locally, just shut it off and leave it off. Or let's say, for example, that there's a massive pandemic and the entire market of steel <laughs> detailing just happens to drop out and you don't have that much work for guys. And you were you had eight guys who were working constantly and now you're down to three, right? All right, we'll, we'll switch scale your machine up, down. right? We'll scale it down for you yep. today, right now. And instead of paying you know, $2 and 30 cents an hour split among eight users. Now you're going to pay 75 cents an hour split among three users. 
Now, how long does it take to make that scale up or down happen? So the actual change, the system change is as fast as you turn it off. We press a button, a couple buttons, I grant you. And then you turn it back on. So it so can happen within, within five minutes, within five minutes, you can have okay. that. Assuming I'm on the other end of the phone, right? I'm, you know, it's not two o'clock in the morning. We're not here 24 seven, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> but most of the days, you know, most of the hours you, you send me a message and I'll take care of it right away. Uh, no problem. But it literally is that fast. You can go from one machine to another, just like that. You can also have two different machines set up so that if you want to be able to do it, you know, you've got a couple of guys that sometimes work for you and you want to be able to turn their machine off. And when you need them, you can do that. No problem. We'll take care of it. Um, but that almost instant scalability is a big deal. And as you, as you add more people on that water tower method that I talked about earlier, the ab ability to divide those resources becomes much more valuable because if you take a machine that's six times faster than the average user needs, it is really, really fast. And so when, you know, user five out of six hits process, they've got six times the processing power to get that done, right? Now it's not actually sure. six times because we're trying to use that efficiently to save you money as, as you scale up, but it is a right. really fast processor with a whole bunch of RAM that is all available to all six users. Right. So you want a system then that it handles whatever peak your whole team throws at it at any given time. But the whole peak, for, uh, I'm sorry. So the peak for the entire team is a whole lot different than the peak as if everyone on the team peaked at the exact same, exact time. same time. Right. Right. So let's say it, on average, only one person at any given time out of a team of four people is hitting that process button is really spiking the system. Right. So then you only have to design for one X, right. Or like 1.4 X to handle all the other stuff that those right. other to four. handle them doing their work, their, their low key work at the same time. Right. Right. So you, you get that advantage on both sides where you get way more power when you need it, but on average, you're not paying that ridiculous rate of money that you would need for that 4X machine. Right. So, um, and two, if, if you, you don't have to buy the machine that we recommend either, right? You can buy or really rent whatever machine that you want. If you're, if you're like Matt and I, and you just love to have this ridiculous amount of horsepower at your disposal, go ahead, right? Here it is. If you're having, if you've got a week where you know nothing can get in your detailer's ways, you need every ounce of productivity this week, kick up that machine, make sure it is not getting in the way of my detailer's productivity this week. We can do that. And then next week, when you're back to normal work, you can scale it back down. No problem. So the pricing isn't per person, it's per machine, right? So if you want the machine that we recommend for four people, then you can have that, right? But if you want to take that machine that we recommend for four people and you want to put eight people on it because you know that four of them don't work that often or they're, you know, they're not using SDS2 that heavily, that's fine too. That's a and nice you're, extra year. You're little. not even talking about the savings that you get if on top of that you're using split licenses because now right. everybody's using the same machine. If you put four half licenses on that machine, Nobody even notices, right? When you go to model, a modeling license is available. When you go to do drawing editor, a drawing editor license is available, right? But all of that power is there waiting for you when you need it, right? It's right. It's so, you know, per user, you're talking what, $1,500? for the annual software fee that you would be saving basically about, about. Yeah. Uh, and then on top of that, the 2,700 for the, the server that you're going to save. And it hasn't affected how you function at all. You still get what you need and go
go on your way. Yeah. It's, and what's more is that the, it's built for what the economy is going to be in the future. People have worked at home now. They're going they to taste want for it. Right. They're going to want to continue that. It is going to be very, very hard to hire people to move to middle of nowhere, you know, Idaho to be a detailer, right? You know, it, and it doesn't matter. We have detailers working for us from all across the country. Doesn't matter, right? Top to bottom. Yeah. It, Top to bottom, Wisconsin it, to Texas. Yep. It, and one is not more efficient or easier than the next. We didn't, when we hired, when we wanted to hire, all we needed to know was, can you detail? Doesn't matter where you live, right? We can go out there and get the best people as soon as we're ready to hire. And they get to work in their PJs if they want to. And all of that office expense, all of that, you know, relocation expenses, if you're hiring somebody, all of that time. Oh, yeah. Relocation commuting. expenses. Yeah. I, you know, I, I went to a, a, a work for a company and they had to pay me $10,000 just to move there, right? To cover my expenses. You don't have to do that anymore, right? As right. long as you're willing to kind of embrace this methodology, uh, you do, you've got to trust your employees. You have to, but that was always true. It, it, if, if they're right. sitting, true regardless. A, right. if they're sitting across the room from you, they could just as easily sit there and do nothing. And you'll have no idea as if they're right. sitting 2000 miles away from you. Right. And as a detailer, it becomes obvious very quickly that you're not getting any work done. Yep. Either very, you're protective or you're not. I, yeah. If if you work three hours and get eight hours of productivity done, I could care less. Right. That's fine. Get the work done. Right. Make me money and yep. you stay hired. Lose me money and you get fired. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> Be profitable as an employee. And, and they know that. Right. They're used to it. People, there are lazy people in this world, but they they get called out and noticed very very fast in an environment like this so you'll you'll pick up on it and you'll know yeah and also you know the way that we operate with our virtual office anyway you know if if you're using zoom and sharing screens you can very quickly find a way to do everything that you would have done in a formal office together you can accomplish all of that Even all online better. Even right. And everything's better. documented too. You know, when we have a conversation, if it's all in Slack, it's all documented. I can search that. I can recall, Hey, I asked you a question. You gave me an answer. What was it? If I just type in my question, it brings me to that conversation and I can see, Oh, all right. We discussed this. This was the outcome. And, and I've got it handy. You've got that record. Yeah. It is absolutely something you should be doing for your business that, uh, you know, uh, I know there are, are large firms that maintain an office and that rent could be going towards such better things. And the commute time, our, our employees are happier, right? Oh, yeah. They can, we, we can be more flexible with them. We don't have to worry if somebody's going to be in there to unlock the office. If, if a job needs to get done on Sunday, just press the button to turn the server on and you can get it done on Sunday. It's, it's fantastic. And also if, if I need somebody to come and help us for a week, all we do is create a user account for them and they come and they, they log in and they help us for a week. It's, it's transformative. And the coolest thing is with, if you build servers, right. Or basically when you're using cloud or edge or Iris or whatever else the other systems are, you are paying for that server right? They have to maintain it. They have to buy it, right? All of that stuff has to come out of the cost and it's spread out against across 50 users or 500 right. users instead of AWS where it's spread out across literally millions of right. users. Right. You're spreading that cost around. Also, you know, whenever they get close to, let's say they're adding more users, they have to keep buying more and more and more, um, hardware to install so as they grow you can hit the wall and, and i believe they've experienced this a few times where 
they ran a little short of hardware and it's like, hey, you got to hold off while I get more hardware. I have to wait for it to be to arrive for me to install it, for me to get everything going. AWS stays ahead of that curve. Yeah, they are. They, well, yeah, they don't run out of hardware and say, hold on, guys, we got to install some more stuff. Well, and I remember, too, there was a version, I think it was from 2016 to 2017. That's how long we've been using this, this cloud infrastructure. There was a significant step up in the way that SDS2 handled its graphics. And you needed more machine to run it. Yes, right? that was 2017. Yep. And we didn't have to go out and buy new servers or build more cert, right? We just said, okay, an extra 10 cents an hour, we need to run this machine. Right. Boom, we're done. We have that extra processing power. It was... It, it had to do with their swap to OpenGL, I believe. And to this day, I don't understand it fully, but... What's weird is if you have a 2017 or newer SDS system, those files run on a very uh, on the machines that we're currently using. If you want to run 2016 or older, you would think, well, I've got the better system. This will handle it. For some reason, you actually have to downgrade to a worse system in order to get the 2016 and older systems to run. And when I say worse, I mean, it's still a great system, but it is actually cheaper and it is lower as far as the hardware ratings go. But for some reason you have to use the one system for 2017 and up and you cannot, it's not backward compatible. So you still have to use the older system for the 2016 and older. Right. Well, and the reasoning was that one was built for just bulk CPU speed. Right. And the other one used graphics engines to, oh, to accelerate. It? So one had a graphics, you know, graphics card attached to it and others did not. Okay, right. that makes sense. That's that really is one of my favorite things, though. Is every once in a while we come up against a job that has it's usually rolled. It's a whole bunch of rolled stuff, and SDS two, God love them, cannot process rolled materials efficiently. It just whether it's detailing them, whether it's processing that in you know in the model. Although the model seems to be getting faster, they seem to be getting better at this. When you hit detail members on grading on, on rolled pieces, it bogs down like a bear. It is terrible, right? And if you're going to have those days, you're going to have a bunch of those days where, okay, I'm going to have to do this a bunch of times. Hit us up. We'll turn up We'll turn up your machine. And it will literally cost you dollars for the week to get that extra productivity. Right. It, you know, that's actually got me thinking. Now that 2021 has come out, we need to test that and see if that still holds true or if they've bumped up the efficiency on that. Yep. So I know that's been an issue that they've been, they've been aware of it and I think they've been looking to tackle it. So I wonder if that's been handled in 2021. And listen, we absolutely recommend it, right? Don't buy more system that you need. Take the cheap machine, keep throwing stuff at it. When it starts to slow you down and you feel your productivity slowing down because you're waiting for the machine, tell us and we'll boost you up to that next machine. Right. And if it's only for a brief time, that's fine. We'll boost you up and then we'll bring you back down. It's not a problem. Right. Don't do it every day. Cause you'll just annoy us. Right. <laughs> but <laughs> frankly, right. But once a month, you know, you get a, you get a big job and you need some more work or you got more people working and you need more machine. Let us know. We'll boot it up for you. And the other thing that we didn't even talk about, right, are the users, the companies where 99% of your work, you do your own self. You do it locally on your own machine. You got a partner across town and they're working on stuff, but you very rarely need to work together on the same project. When you do, we can be there and have that machine waiting for you, right? Right. So that today I need a machine turned on, turn it on, work today. And then when you're done, turn it off. And our billing is mostly turned off. There's a small fee, very small fee to keep your data all stored because we have to pay to store your data. But it's, it's like I said, dollars a month to, to store that data for you. It's almost nothing. Okay. Um, and so, and also, it just making me think about that. You know, if you work alone, but you want to tag in with a partner, 
you can just turn it on, run for a few hours, a few days, a few weeks, whatever you need and shut it off and you're done. There's no further commitment other than you said that small fee to store the data. But other systems, they tie you in. You're on for a month. You're committed for three months. You know, Commit for three months and we'll give you a discount. But then you're locked in and you're stuck with the lights on and the meter spinning for three months. Yep. Or one month and you only needed it for a couple of days. You know, that's, that's just too much. You're just paying way too much for that. Right. Which is why, why we want to do this, right? Why we want to offer is because, and it's, that's the only way that they can operate, right? They have physical servers to, to bring more users on means they have to buy more hardware. Right. They need to commit because they're committed. Yeah. We don't have to do that, right? And we don't think you should have to either. We we could never justify it. Detailers on a whole, as a whole, are very, they want to know that that license that they paid their blood, sweat, and tears to buy is theirs, right? They don't want to send it off and have it locked into a cloud system. Ours, it, it's yours today. It's yours when it's up. You t- you turn it off, it's yours again. There's no commitment to it at all. The And the only, and we argued about this, right? We had discussions about the startup costs, particularly the Windows licensing and the setup fee, right? Because we hated the fact that you had to, but we have to pay to get that stuff done, right? We can't eat it. So if you turn your machine on for a week and then you never lose it or never use it again, we would get killed, right? Oops. Right, <laughs> right. We would never have that money, <laughs> so we have to charge a setup fee, and we have to charge for Windows because Windows charges us. But after that, it's the only costs are the costs that we incur. Right, there are no extra fees. Right, it's right. and then we've got that also scheduled to be spaced out too. Right, so the first month you're paying the setup fee, and the second month is when you have the Windows fee. And also, if you if you're wrapped up within that first month there's no windows fee because there's a grace period of 30 days on windows am i correct right right so if 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 you want to try the system right we can do that no problem we get it set up and then we turn it back off once we have to start spending money that's when we have to charge money because we we're not a charity right like we have to we have to cover our bills at least the way that we make any money off this at all at all right is over the months right that we've got a percentage on top of the amazon server for costs that come back to us right that's how we make money that's what makes it worthwhile to us beyond that it's whatever our costs are are your costs that's it all right, so one of the things we have to talk about is where our system works great, right, and where it doesn't. We talked already about the follow the sun method, right? If you're following the sun, you're going to still save money, but you're going to save less money because you're not benefiting from the ability to turn the machine off. Right. Right. The other is that is users who each have individual licenses as opposed to a company that has a group of licenses. Okay. So what SDS2, the, how their licensing works is that each machine can run a licensed server. Right. Every licensed server can only pull from one license, one HASP, right? You can't pull from multiple Correct. HASPs and net them into one licensed server. So in order to deal with that, if we've got two different HASPs, what we have to do instead is to spin up two individual machines and link them into one hard drive that's shared between the two. Okay. Okay. Now that is much more similar to you're in an office and you guys are both working on machines locally, right? Sure. We've got to spin up two machines. They're still cheap, right? But the problem is that the, the latency goes up slightly from two machines versus one machine. It is not, it does not perform as well as that that water tower method that I talked about. Okay, so basically you've got two virtual machines communicating with each other, and so there's an added latency, whereas the primary method is to have everyone logged into one machine that talks to itself, so it's instantaneous. Yep, yep. Okay. 
So it's, and Amazon has the best network in the world, right? So it is a 10 gigabit network to get to this storage. It is still as fast as, but it's not as fast as being on the same physical hardware, right? It doesn't right, have right. That, that makes sense. That speed to it, right? So that's the one place where if you're doing it that way, you still get a lot of benefits, but it's not as quick. It, uh, we recommend if one company owns both those hasps that you do a network license for them and you get them both. And even if possible, a split license and you get those up into the cloud using Haspless. That is absolutely the fastest way to do it, right? Right. Um, one of the benefits that we didn't talk about that uses that same structure, right, is company X and Y both use their system, right? Today, they need to work on a project together, right? For the next month, we can network them together and they can work on that same system. They can oh, both use yeah. their indi okay. individual machines and both work through a system on the cloud together. All right, so and, if you've got the structural detailer and the MISC metals detailers are two different companies, they can get into the same model at the same time, but but with separate licenses because they each own their own SDS software. Yep. So they can then lump that together by each having their own machine on the system. Right. And you can even grant access to a couple different levels. We can part off hard drives and all that stuff. So you can continue to work on some stuff. They can only access what you want them to access and not more than that. Um, it, there's all sorts of stuff that we can do because this is all on Amazon's cloud services that we can, put stuff and, and cross connect it with each other. Um, and we're hoping to be able to really build a network of people who are using our, our system, who can help each other out when they need, uh, you know, fill the peaks in other people's demand by saying, okay, you can have, you know, Bob from our scrubbing department for the day. Cause we, you know, he'd, he'd be laid off otherwise or for the week. Um, and, and, really find that availability. So we, we're still working on that, how to handle the logistics of it, how to get commu people communicating with each other. But it's something we'd, we'd really like because uh, we hate to see guys laid off um, and we hate to see guys work in those 60, 70 hour weeks to try and get done a project because productivity goes <laughs> in those extra hours. Absolutely. Absolutely. <sighs> okay. It's kind of like speeding in your car. Your fuel efficiency actually increases up until, what is it, about 45 miles an hour? And then it starts to taper off as you get close to about 60 or 70. And once you tip over that, it drops like a stone. Yep. Well, human efficiency is kind of the same way. You know, once you hit about that 35 to 45 uh, hour work week, you're kind of done. You, yep. you should stop because you could keep working and you'll get more work done. But you're going to get less. It's a diminishing return. You get less work per hour after that. So, you know, it, it's kind of crazy to think that you have to pay somebody time and a half when you're getting half the labor of each additional hour, you know, as, as that time stretches on and on and on. It's just yeah. a terrible way to, to try to earn a living. So, you know, I'm pretty proud of where we've come, how far we've come. I, you know, I feel like it's ready for people to, to really benefit from. We've showed people, they've used it, they've loved it. Um, but we're really trying to get it out to market now. Um, if you have any questions, if you want to give it a try, even for a day, just let us know. We'll, we'll set you up. Uh, we'll put the website down there below. Um, but again, this, this is built for the detailers, right? Yes, absolutely. We're making money off it, right? But our goal is to find ways for you to save as much as you possibly can and to be able to compete as efficiently as possible. And really for you not to have to wait for your server, for your machine, for your SDS2 to run. It's frustrating. It's annoying. Get all the money you can. Go make it. We'll see you back here on the Steel Farm.